Welcome to today's forum about Igniting Change, the final report and recommendations of the Advisory Committee on Equity, Diversity, Inclusion and Decolonization. My name is Patricia Albanese and I'm the Chair of the Board of Directors for the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences. A few housekeeping notes for this session before we begin. Today's presentation will take place in English with simultaneous interpretation into French. La présentation d'aujourd'hui se déroule en, ang en anglais avec une interprétation simultanée en français. In addition, we're offering automated closed captioning in English via Zoom. You may access both the closed captioning and the simultaneous interpretation from the bottom of your Zoom window. For simultaneous interpretation, please select French. During the question and answer period, if any questions or responses are provided in French, the English interpretation can be heard from the same interpreter via the French channel. After the presentation, the committee will be happy to take questions. You can enter your questions regarding the report in the question tab found at the bottom of the Zoom window. I'm speaking to you from Toronto the territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples, a territory covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty, Treaty 13, and the Williams Treaties. As a faculty member at Ryerson University, uh, we as a community, and I personally have been doing a lot of thinking about the land upon which my university is located, because where Ryerson now stands sat the Toronto Normal School, a training facility for residential school teachers. Egerton Ryerson's policies and the Toronto Normal School caused tremendous harm to Indigenous children and families, harm that continues to impact ind Indigenous peoples right across Canada to this day. As a settler, Federation board chair, and member of the Ryerson community, I'm committed to all, doing all I can to support the well-being of Indigenous colleagues, staff, students, and community members on and off my university campus. I'd also like to acknowledge that the Federation office and most of the staff are located on unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. I know that all of you right across the country on territories of diverse nations are joining us today because working against systemic racism and towards decolonization are important to you. I also invite you to reflect on the brutal acts of anti-Asian racism that we're currently witnessing. It's our responsibility to call out and to stamp out this hate and create safer spaces for all to thrive. Reflecting on marginalization, violence and colonization seem especially relevant today because we'll be discussing our commitment to combat systemic exclusionary practices that have kept too many of our colleagues in the margins for too long. Before we engage in that important conversation with our guests, I'd like to acknowledge that we've made mistakes over the past two years since a case of racial profiling and anti-Black racism took place at Congress 2019 against Shelby McPhee and graduate student, uh, graduate student and member of the Black Canadian Studies Association. But we've also learned a great deal individually and collectively since then. Most critically, we learned that like many other institutions, we're not equipped to handle complex challenges connected to addressing systemic racism and exclusions in academia and outside it. That's why this, important, uh, this report is so necessary and important today. Already, igniting change has taught me a great deal and more importantly, has inspired me and given me courage because it provides a roadmap for change. I know that many among us at the Federation, on the board, within our associations, and at our universities and home departments can use a hand in learning more and doing more when it comes to equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization. You'll learn more about it today, but I, I, I wish to start by saying that the Federation and its board, and many of uh, the members of the board are on this call today, including incoming board chair Mike Degagne, we fully and wholeheartedly endorse this report. We're committed to acting on its recommendations and to being publicly accountable to ensuring that we make the necessary changes. We'll use the powerful words of this report to chart a new course. We will use its many, many valuable parts thoughtfully and meaningfully towards transformative change. 
I'm grateful to the Congress Advisory Committee members who worked tirelessly over seven months, offering countless hours to bring this report to us. Before I introduce the three incredible women joining us today, please allow me one more minute to publicly thank the members of the committee who contributed their expertise to this report. Dr. Wesley Critchlow, Critical Race Professor at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology and member of the Federation Board. Dr. J. Dolmage, assist, uh, Associate Professor, sorry, Associate Chair, Undergraduate Communication Outcome Initiative and Professor of English Language and Literature at the University of Waterloo. Dr. Florence Glanfield, Vice Provost Indigenous Programming, uh, and research and professor of secondary education at the University of Alberta. Claudia Malacrida, professor of sociology and board of governors research chair emerita at the University of Lethbridge and member of the Federation board. And José Villeneuve, associate professor of French linguistics at Campus Saint-Jean at the University of Alberta. And presenting the report today, Dr. Marie Baptiste, Order of Canada, Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, 2019 Pierre Elliott Trudeau Fellow, and Professor Emerita Educational Foundations at the University of Saskatchewan. Committee Vice Chair, Dr. Noreen Golfman, Professor of English and former Provost and Vice President Academic at Memorial University. And finally, the chair of the Congress Advisory Committee on Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Decolonization, Dr. Melinda Smith, the Vice Provost, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the Uni University of Calgary, Professor of Political Science, and 2018 Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation Fellow. She is nationally recognized and deeply respected for her work on equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization. Dr. Smith, Dr. Golfman and Dr. Batiste, you have my deepest respect and gratitude. Thank you and welcome. Now I turn things over to you. Good afternoon and thank you and uh, uh, Patricia for those warm words of welcome and also for your deep uh, your recognition uh, and deep commitment to accountability. I want to thank the members of the audience who are here um, and especially to the members of the advisory committee who are here. So my, as, uh, my name is Melinda Smith and I am uh, in Calgary, which is the territory, um, the tr traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta and the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Um, before I um, begin my presentation on the report, Igniting Change, I want to take a moment uh, to acknowledge the committee. So if my slides could be shared, that would be greatly appreciated. So we can go to the next slide, please. Um, these, the members of the committee have been introduced. I also want to um, highlight what a privilege it has been working with these uh, distinguished scholars from across Canada and with my vice chair, uh, Professor Golfman. Next slide, please. But what I want to say most of all about this committee is what it has taught, and before I go into the report, is what it's taught us and taught me about this work. Equity, diversity, inclusion has a long genealogy in Canada. The second D, which Dr. Marie Batiste in particular will be speaking to, also has a long genealogy in the social sciences and humanities. 
in tandem, EDID, they don't. So we owe a deep gratitude to this committee, to those who sat at this table to, en to enable us to bring these, these letters together, but also to think of them in tandem. What do they mean? To the members, so I want to so personally, I want to share my deep gratitude to, to them. And also to say, as someone who's been working on this, on, on EDI in particular, but also decolonization via political science for over 30 years, that I learned an enormous amount. And we have talked about the humility that learning has meant for us, but also the ways in which it reminds us that we come to this table and to the journey from different places. And that, in, and we ought to be cognizant of that, that we are engaged in lifelong learning. I also wanna say what this EDID has taught us, and which is also, I think, a lesson that we can bring from the social science and humanities communities to which we all belong. Equity and diversity, employment equity, before that voluntary from action has a long history in Canada, decades. And yet today we are still grappling with it as if it's 101. That's, that's a, a, a lesson to be thought of. That the fact that we have moved, not moved so far has led to an incredible cynicism. The idea that equity and diversity is non-performative, that the words, the acronyms are used and they do not often mean what they say and they certainly don't do what they are intended to do. To repeat, that's generated a lot of cynicism about how effective anything under this rubric can be. And as we note in the report, when people see something as big as this mandate sent to an equity committee that also engendered cynicism because they see these committees and task force, including offices like my own, as places where important, meaningful uh, issues and desired change, it's pla those are places where they go to die that they ought to be all on diversity tour, detours where they get deflected, not taken up seriously. So we came to this work recognizing the context in which we worked. The statements as non-performative, the failure to deliver on promises, and we recognize the need for accountability as, to, as members of this committee, but also to the broader community that what we that we would not rush to produce something that could get um, become just another checkbox. Check went to that committee. Check went to that unconscious bias workshop. Check, you know, uh, gender inclusive language. Check. We wanted to think much more complexly, historically, uh, holistically about these issues. So a second issue that we grapple with is that second D, as I said. And we wanted, often decolonization is pitted as decolonize, not diversify. They're seen as polar opposite. Decolonization, we also recognize very quickly, loosely associated with indigenization and reconciliation. And Dr. Marie Matisse is gonna to speak to this more optimally. They use us as interchangeable. But we are the members of the social science and humanities community. We deal with language, we deal with questions of power, we deal with questions of history, we deal with questions of judgment. So we know that the intersections of these words must mean something more than that individually and, and as the sum of their parts. And so this was an exercise in meaning making, how to make sure that the E, the D and the I and the D meant something different from that history that has failed us so miserably in terms of delivering a more equitable, diverse, inclusive, and decolonizing university, college, and higher education sector. Thirdly, and by way of thanks to the committee again, and the work 
that you have you are reviewing as we speak. The table matters. The diversity of the table matters. I will continue to insist on this and as the committee. The table, who sits at it, whether it's reflective of our broader social science and humanities community, our universities, and the broader society. The critique of homogeneity at the table, a critique of systemic whiteness, a, a, a critique of diversifying whiteness, perhaps, when people say, oh, but the people, you just can't see the invisible disabilities. All of this came into full, to our full attention when we think about the context that led us to this discussion, which is the context of racial profiling and anti-Black racism, because those are visible, right, Blackness, racialization, but what's invisible is the same invisible disabilities that often get placed up in order to justify homogenous tables. And our committee was very attentive to taking up ableism, to taking up linguistic and cultural minorities, other forms of diversity, diversities. And we were very attentive um, um, to thinking about these kinds of issues. So homog homogeneity, this is a critique of homogeneity. What's at, who's at the table shapes what's on the menu. And it also shapes what questions are raised. It shapes what, which communities are engaged and it shapes outcomes. Who's at the table also helps us decide whether EDID is integrative to the work or whether it is a sidebar or a silo or on the margins. How we conceive of this, our imaginary, uh, it's fundamental to this work in the 21st century in Canada. So at our table, we had the brilliance of scholars from across the social science and humanities community across disciplines in humanities and social sciences, across the country, attentive to uh, five equity seeking groups, not just rhetorically, but we tried to de deal with them deeply and, in, and at the same time. What does it mean to take um, disabilities and ableism seriously? What does it mean to take LGBTQ2 plus and the queer alphabet seriously? What does it mean to take gender, gender identity, and gender expression seriously? What does it mean to take disaggregated, racialized communities, Black, South Asian, East Asian, Japanese, Filipino, Korean, seriously? Matters significantly in an environment shaped by anti-Black racism, COVID racisms, anti-Asian racisms intersect here, where it, people stereotype Chinese, Filipino, Korean, Japanese, so the Asians all become homogenized. So this matters very seriously to social science and humanities communities, but I would say the universities. This is not a checkbox. This is not an, a single action plan. This is about systemic change. So I, I so now let me go to the, so in this thing here, we, uh, we, we this is a question we remind ourselves that, about why we are here. The why is a question about justice. The why is a question about doing things, how we do things, including doing things differently, and why we are doing these things differently. And we must be attentive to who's doing things differently, because if we are not changing that, we are not changing systems of power, we're not changing system of oppression, then this kind of work leads to further cynicism. Next slide, please. So this is about igniting change, not at the margins, but systemic change 
it's about structures of power and, 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 and in, inequity are, inequities are about power. Least we forget. So next slide, please. Our mandate soon on paper looks very simple and straightforward, but as we engage in the work, the complexity of what that meant and what it still means if we took it seriously is really important. Because we could have presented the report to the board and the CEO and as reports, still they go to the, to, to the table. So we still have to see what unfolds as after today. What are the full range of events organized by the Federation? Does that just mean we focus on Congress narrowly or a suite of activities? How do we think complexly about those issues? Is, is Congress just an event or it's, is it a community? And so we took it as a community, which means then that what happens in terms of what we advise and recommend is about the associations that meet at Congress. There, it's about the, so, the disciplines that meet at Congress. It is about the disciplines and the departments that they are connected to and the universities they are connected to. It is about a community. So we are proposing changes for the Federation, yes, but also for this broader community. And that means that we are all involved and all implicated in this work, but that some of us are accountable for the harms we cause, and that cannot get overshadowed by discussions about our broader implicatedness in this work. The other thing, as I alluded to previously, is that we are talking about things like equitable, accessible, and inclusive. Those words get loosely used. There's a whole discussion about the inclusive turn. And so we took those principles seriously, and you'll see in our def uh, definitions and principles that we took pains to define them in ways that are not just superficial or just kind of technocratic gestures. And we see also the ways in which loosely decolonization, reconciliation, and indigenization are used. We understand, and I understand, decolonization as inclusive of place and territoriality, but also this is part of a global initiative which has impacted our universities. So on the surface, the mandate looks fairly routine. If we think deeply about it as the committee tried to do, you'll see it means more. Next slide, please. So the overview of the report that you would have read and you were going through, you'll see it has an executive summary and recommendations. We, we talk about the work of the committee we talk about uh, that second D, which we'll come to, the 43 recommendations. And we talk about better practices for inclusive conference guides. What I would suggest to you with each of these pieces, including the charter, is that they are, they take seriously anti-racism and anti-colonialism, the context in which this work emerged, as well as our need to pivot with that in, in consideration to the future, which is to think carefully about how do we take equity, diversity, inclusion, decolonization in tandem seriously and mindful of five equity deserving groups. And I credit Dr. Wisdom Teddy at University of Toronto for this equity deserving groups. Next slide, please. Sorry, back up. Appendix one and appendix two is part of our work where we look at the work that the Federation has done previously, where in the appendix one, you'll see the highlight on what is the normative EDI, EDI approach, which is gender equity. So you have gender equity and the other equity groups, gender and diversity, diversity means the other equity groups, women and the other equity seeking groups, you know the rhetorical and uh, 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 the language that's used. And as I said, language is associated with power, who gets included, who gets erased. And so how we, how we name things becomes really important. Appendix two talks about the uneven ways we have taken up equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization in the Federation, and also how it's waxed and waned. So this is to remind us that this work is not new. 
and, 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 and scholars before us have tried to engage in it and how they've engaged in it. We hope our report helps us to take it to another level. Next slide, please. There are key concepts in our work and you will see even in the performance of, in, of this uh, presentation that accessibility is partially addressed. If you think about um, what that means seriously, we sometimes means disabilities. It, and the question is how do we understand those disabilities uh, or how we understand ableism? We think about diversity. <clears throat> What's gets incorporated into diversity are disciplines or peoples or perspectives or all in tandem. We define a decolonization. What do we mean by this? Be, beyond some rhetorical gestures. How would I, how would you, can you diversify a discipline, a curriculum, a university without indigenous peoples in the space, without non-white peoples in the space, without non-Europeans in the space? What are we using the uh, decolonization as a metaphor? Are we using it loosely to refer to all kinds of social justice concepts as a, a, a Tuck and Wang have outlined? We need to be mindful of our language. We need to decolonize our mind, our, our ways of being, or as Bob Mali said, we need to uh, um, um, address mental slavery. So we take decolonization seriously. What it requires of us means we must take it to another level beyond what is often the superficial or uh, approaches that, 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 that emerge. We take equity seriously. It's a question of justice. It's not just about additive or checkbox. Oh, we went to this workshop or we, we included this speaker this time or this topic. It's not a topic. It's not a recommendation. It is fundamentally about changing how we do things and the way we do things and who gets to do the doing. And inclusion included into what? Included by whom? All of these are questions of power. And so unless we start to address these seriously, we are actually uh, fiddling around at the edges. And at the core of this, fundamental to all of this is human dignity. Do we value, do we understand what that means, human rights and human dignity? And do, or do we still have these deficit notions of racialized people or indigenous peoples? Or do we still have these deficit, tyranny of low expectations for people who are other than white? It, it, it plays out in very subtle ways, but we had to grapple with those kinds of things because that, that tells us how people differently are treated at Congress, other Federation events, in our disciplines, in our universities, at the tables of power where decisions are made about what constitutes equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization, and inclusive excellence. I've heard some say this is a nonsense term, but what it does point us to is that we, we are required, if we believe in excellence, and we believe excellence is not rooted in one kind of identity, one demographic group, or one kind of ways of, of counting this or counting that, what does it require of us to do in terms of redefinition? So language matters, but language plays out in all kinds of ways. Next slide, please. So, uh, so obviously we're not gonna go through all the details of the report, but it does include some detailed work, including the shadow of the pandemic. It includes the committee's work. It includes addressing the task force on contingency planning for Congress. And you will see a lot of our recommendations already in there. We had multiple uh, consultations with, with the social science and humanities communities where what was admirable about all of that is the extent to which those communities, we learned about scholarly associations who are already doing the work and that the Federation needed to learn from them. We learned about national associations who are already doing the work. As I reminded my colleagues at the Federation, the Federation used to be a leader in equity, diversity, inclusion, and it now needs to learn from other associations and, and leapfrog to actually pick up the pace and change. 
Next slide, please. So the background to this, let's not, least we forget, is that it's racial profiling and the harms of racial profiling and the embarrassment of racial profiling. It's not about education. It's not even about class in this case. It is about assumptions made about people by virtue of what they look like. It's not about knowledge. And like I said, people, if you're racially profiled, people don't know anything about you except the color of your skin. And they impute to that color of your skin something less than. Uncon and you can call it unconscious emotion, the assumption that you, you people are not as qualified. But what it, what it says is from there, a whole, series, a whole chain of events emerge and we are still grappling with them because racism isn't an incident. It's part, it's systemic, it's structural. It's rooted in anti-blackness, uh, anti it's rooted in enslavement, unacknowledged, and, and our disciplines and our universities, including our university leaderships, must address it. Next slide, please. We also have to be dealing with time, which the shift from Congress 2020 to Congress 2021 and the themes, the work that the Black Canadian Studies Association did to get the historic theme of confronting colonialism and anti-Black racism. And that theme was about bridging all kinds of divides, disciplinary, uh, national divides, uh, political and ideological divides. So we owe a debt of gratitude and thanks to the Black Canadian Studies Association. They ignited change. The conversations we are having were enabled by them. Small group, mighty group, and we indebted. But the harms persist and reconciliation is required. We are also faced then as a, group, as a committee, we're dealing with the Northern relations themes, with indigeneity, because part of the 2020 Congress was about dealing with colonialism and with, the, with continuing conversations around reconciliation and with dealing with indigenization, what they required of us. And so again, bridging that territorial uh, from UBC to Western to Al University of Alberta, the complexity in the moving parts meant dealing with a whole range of issues. And it seems to me, there are two things the social science and humanities communities can think about. The importance of the role we could play were we to take these issues seriously in shaping these conversations, in the work of our disciplines. But it also requires us to do more than talk or write great books or articles or statements. It requires us to be different to do differently. Next slide, please. Um, and the shifting territories um, uh, of, this, of, of this work um, from Vancouver to London to Edmonton, we had to, to think about whether Congress this time was going to be face-to-face -face, hybrid or virtual how to repair the harms also while other harms are being enacted, how to rebuild relationships. This is not a gesture. This is dealing with the deep issues. And as the, uh, our engagement said, if the, the Federation doesn't take these issues seriously, it would become irrelevant. So this report of igniting change is to ensure that our community because it is our community, does not become irrelevant. That it becomes, it takes up the res its responsibility to participate in these conversations. And it must repair relations with indigenous advisory circle. So we can't be having these big ideas, big blue sky thinking about Congress and other Federation events, these remarkable themes, if we aren't practicing what those themes allude to. So that's not just the, the thinking and the talking. We are back to the doing. 
The doing reminds us, as our indigenous colleagues pointed out, that relationships matter. Relationships with indigenous peoples, with the territories, with the land, indigenous legal orders matter. Relationship with our institutions, which are were designed without many of us in mind, which were rooted in, in sometimes histories of enslavement or, or and, and colonialism, the, the names of the institutions, the symbols of the institutions, the governance structures of the institutions, the leadership styles, all require connection. Next, so relationships matter. And it seems to me building relationships in the social science community matter. So I, I so we're going to talk about the work. So I want to turn the floor over now to my colleague, Dr. Noreen Government, who will take up some of this conversation around some of the, the dimensions of the work we engaged in. Okay, uh, thank you, Melinda, very much. And welcome everybody. I know we have a, a big audience out there listening and attending to this for which the committee is grateful. We've been waiting uh, a long seven months for an audience. So it's great to know how much interest there is in the work of the committee. Uh, I am a member of the Memorial University community and Memorial University has six campuses now across the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. And our most recent campus is situated in Labrador. This is a real turning point for Memorial in situating a campus in the uh, part of the province where most of our indigenous peoples live. The lands on which all of our campuses are situated are the traditional territories of diverse indigenous groups. And I wish to acknowledge their histories and cultures of the Beothics, the Mi'kmaq, the Innu and the Inuit. And before I speak, and I will speak very briefly about the work of the committee, Melinda's already said um, a, a quite a bit, I think, about the challenges that we have faced and of course about our mandate. I do wish to acknowledge, and I can't see her on my screen, so I won't see how much she might be blushing when I say this, but I do know I'm speaking on behalf of the committee when I say that she has been the driving force behind this 200 page plus report that you've all received. And uh, without her leadership and her passion and her dedication, the clarity of her purpose, we would not be here today. We might be here at another seven months, but we would not be here today. So uh, on behalf of all of us on the committee, we are deeply, deeply grateful to Melinda for her persistence and the uh, high expectations and demands that she placed on us. Like her, we all learned a great deal, but I think it's important to say we all learned a great deal from Dr. Smith. So thank you, Melinda, for your um, colleagueship and your inspiring leadership in this important work. Um, you have heard that the appendices of this report refer to the past work of the Federation. Um, that's work that Melinda, not surprisingly, was very much a foundational part of when she was VP Equity for the Foundation, for the Federation rather, when I was president a number of years ago. And there is a line of continuity, an uneven one, I might add. And the report acknowledges, it, acknowledges this between the work that Melinda and some of her predecessors certainly started on equity. Um, but uh, that line takes us to this moment. In some ways, and I hope Melinda herself feels this way, this is if not the end point, it is certainly a resolving moment uh, of the important work that began then. And it's opened up, of course, to the full meaning of diversity, inclusion, and now decolonization. Um, so those appendices are important and I encourage everybody to look at them because you might find yourself in that history, those narratives of where the Federation more or less started in thinking through what these terms meant, although much more limited 
by the concept of gender. And that was, of course, part of that historical moment when gender was the first thing most of us in the wake of feminism. And because of the nature of our academic and institutional work, we're thinking about what we've gone a lot further since, if not in practice, at least our, we have opened ourselves up to just how open we need to be. Um, our first challenge in the report uh, really takes this on in some detail because it's important for the narrative history, we think, of this, of this important um, process uh, to point out that the task force on contingency planning that had been established by the Federation in view of the pandemic the need to think very quickly, as all of our institutions have, about a virtual, possibly a hybrid conference. Um, that work had already started. So we found it uh, a little disconcerting that our committee was formed a bit after that, and a bit of an, not so much an afterthought, but not having been thought of at the outset as part of that engagement with contingency planning that we were sort of living the very experience that our committee was set out to try and work through. And that is a fully integrated approach to Congress planning. And for that matter, the ongoing and extra work of the Federation, because the Federation does more than Congress, although it is the lion's share of the work of a, a Federation staff and, of course, of most of our societies and associations. Um, we did engage, as Melinda has already said, with the social science humanities communities. And in particular, at the outset, consultation was critical to have with the Black Canadian Studies Association um, that had been so involved as a direct and immediate response, an urgent response to the racial profiling that had happened at UBC. And in the subsequent conversations that transpired around what an appropriate response should be on the part of the larger community, but also how that work could be focused through the theme of conference, which is always an important way of framing what Congress discussions, conversations, big and plenary lectures um, are all, all being considered in view of. So um, there is some um, unevenness, let's say, in thinking through all that, which we acknowledge is part of the difficulty of this very kind of work. We also spoke to the um, to scholarly associations that were available. We put out the call widely throughout the Federation. Of course, people are busy. Not everybody is necessarily thinking through these issues. But um, we did have a robust response from many and members of our advisory committee took part uh, in very, very careful attending to uh, those conversations on the part of largely the leaders of your scholarly associations to determine what your thinking was to four questions that we had put out, thinking ideally about what would a Congress look like? What would the work of the Federation look like um, if we could really attend to equity, diversity, inclusivity, and decolonization? And um, that those conversations have already been happening, as Melinda's already said, in some associations more actively than others. But we learned a great deal from those conversations and they are reflected in some detail in the report. And I hope that those of you who participated will see yourself reflected there as well. Um, we also spoke, of course, to the two important national bodies um, that have so much to do with our research work, with our leadership, with governance of our institutions. And that is, of course, SHRC and Universities Canada. And um, it was interesting not only to hear from them, but if I can say so, quite honestly, for them to hear about what we were up to, how we wanted to push their own work and to engage in solidarity in leadership with the work that we imagined that this report would end up generating. 
Um, so those conversations are also reflected perhaps more briefly than those of the scholarly associations. But again, I invite you to look at the section um, that really details how the committee both set out to work and how it carried on until this very moment. Um, and Melinda, I think um, this is the moment to pass it back on to you. Um, if we are going to the inclusive conference guide, so, if I'm correct. Thank, thank, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Goffman. Uh, what we will do is so the, that the other part of the um, the work of the committee is actually. Uh, the inclusive conference guide, but what I will do is I'll, I'll come back to that guide. I just, this is just a, to highlight um, the overall work of the committee, the, the guide, because what we tried to do is to say, if we took the idea of EDID seriously, what would a, a conference guide look like? Not just Congress, but guides across the social science and minds communities. And what was interesting is the research our research, but also the research of the, the, the area that worked with us is that found is that these tend to be, again, singular issues. We tried to bring them together for the five equity seeking groups that, have be, that are the focus of, of EDI work in, uh, EDID work in Canada um, to bring them all together in one guide. So I think this would be a resource, good, a good resource for the university, but I'll pass that for the moment because what I want us to do but what I want, want us to do is to say in that guide and in the, the, the presentation that the Dr. Marie Batiste is going to give right next is that rather than the language of better uh, or best practices, we found we want to highlight better or promising practices to say this, this is part of an ongoing work uh, in, in, in the social science humanities community to uh, an ongoing work of improvement, reiterations, and so on. So. What I'll do next is turn the, the floor over to Dr. Marie Batiste, who will speak more thoroughly about the second D, decolonization in our mandate. Thank you, Melinda. And indeed, um, I would like to start by echoing um, the comments made. Uh, first of all, to, to recognize that I am on Treaty 6 territories of uh, diverse Indigenous nations, uh, the Nehiawe, Nakawe, uh, Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, and the Dene, and the homelands of the Métis. Uh, I'm Mi'kmaq from a, and I'm a visitor here on, on Treaty 6 territories. Um, and um, I want to uh, echo the, the, the comment made by Noreen, how important Noreen, uh, I mean, uh, Melinda has been to the, um, I would say as a, a kind of like a, a, a musical orchestra of people, you have to have someone who is actually going to lead that and put that together in a, in a, in a musical piece. And that is what she has done for us by helping us bring all of our various strengths and knowledges together and giving us a, a, a way to, to uh, put those together in this particular um, fashion. So um, what I, uh, wanted to say is that importantly um, in the work that has been done at Congress there's been many ways in which Indigenous people have been uh, brought in through uh, different associations as well as as speakers and and have, have had some place in Congress and other places but we that has been kind of an additive kind of thing and what we want to do is to solidify um, their presence um, in a decolonization framework. And so decolonization was something, a mandate that was offered uh, to us as, a, as through the Federation um, Board. And so we are really um, trying to build this and b help people become aware of it. In our principles that we have noted, uh, the principles and the processes and practices of decolonization are fundamental to the equitable, diverse, enlightened, and inclusive social sciences and humanities uh, community in Canada. And so we believe um, that the sustainable uh, future of higher education requires the confronting and settle unsettling 
the impact of colonial histories, ideologies, experiences, and legacies on the disciplines, archives, canons, curricula, methodologies, and pedagogies, as well as on the structures of government, of governance, uh, institutional design, the cultures, the symbols, and ceremonies. And all of that is, is a beginning place that we think will help us get to the, to the steps that are necessary and ongoing. Um, it is not, as we noted, not a checkbox uh, of things to do, um, but it really means a very conscientization of unlearning and uncovering the transforming legacies of colonialism, as well as utilizing the educational and, uh, and knowledge systems available to uh, help us to relearn and rebuild the social, cultural, linguistic foundations that were lost or eroded in and through colonialism. And so what we are asking um, Congress and, and all of the um, associations as they begin to do their work, take out knowledges, is to, re to, to really think about where do you make space? So making space and then balancing and generating diverse knowledge systems in academia, including from indigenous and other colonized nations, peoples, and cultural knowledge systems. Next slide. So in my work and in the work that, um, you know, in my writings that I do, I often talk about the two pronged processes of, of decolonization. And in my mind, they are both the, um, the deconstruction, if we can use the word from Derrida, a, a deconstruction of what exists. And that deconstruction leads us to the first point, to the uh, unsettling. And that unsettling notions are really turning us to how we need to um, recognize that within the knowledge systems that exist, there are ways in which uh, multiple layers of discursive, um, ideological, um, and um, uh, normalizing practices have led us to the place where we are where um, indigenous as well as equity deserving groups have found themselves on the outside of those particular knowledges and knowledge systems, as well as the ways in which they produce them and what counts. Um, so we need to begin a process of unlearning the structures of colonialism and Eurocentric colonialism and uncovering the the injustices that have been there, and then transforming uh, the uh, the enduring legacies of colonialism in those educational systems. As we go then to the the next item is really about taking and moving these of uh, this uh, this confronting notion of unpacking and unsettling the discriminating discourses. Um, of Eurocentric colonialism and in institutions. And then as we get to the second point um, in the next uh, item here, taking it is this uh, elements of relearning. Um, I, I want to, to point out that, you know, in the colonialism structures that we currently have, there have been ways in which indigenous peoples have been brought in, but we have not been brought in as a, as a different knowledge system that is equal to and, and, and has a much longer foundation than even the, um, the contemporary um, or the knowledge systems that have been existing as a result of the um, Eurocentric foundations and disciplinary knowledge systems that we have. And so uh, as part of this, we want to begin to think about how do we move those um, things forward. And part of the, the approach we've done, and I take it to the next slide, is that as we have been moving to um, our, our approach, and you'll see it in the report, is that we wanted to look at the, both the, the international and the national levels of, of which um, we've looked at uh, the legacies of colonialism and recognizing that there has been much work that has been done in terms of advocating activism and, and putting forward some clear guidances to um, nations around the world about how they might decolonize. In the Canadian context, 
um, indigenous peoples have been recognized along with the uh, independence of this country in the constitution with Aboriginal and treaty rights. And so those Aboriginal and treaty rights include indigenous knowledges, indigenous uh, ways of knowing, indigenous um, uh, protocols and practices and so on, so that we need to begin to find a way to balance those particular kinds of knowledge systems, recognizing that in every instance, um, the uh, Congress is taking place on some lands, and typically it is lands that have been displacing Indigenous people from them, um, re erasing them, removing them, um, and at the same time acknowledging them, but not giving them a place in the institution. So um, as we move to the next point of those, is we want to strengthen the human dignity, the human rights, the political and cultural rights with respect to people's cultures and knowledge systems. So it's not, um, it is much more, it's a deeper sense of not the tick box, but really a much broader sense of recognizing that there are peoples like, especially Indigenous people with rights. And then we have charter rights, and those rights are about uh, dealing with those uh, injustices that have been part of colonized systems. So then um, in, in, the, in the next slide is to, to recognize that Congress needs to follow a few uh, kinds of things that will get us to removing all those barriers for effective participation of all equity deserving groups and Indigenous people. And we have offered um, at least some aspects of anti-racism, anti-colonialism, and decolonizing educational remedies and guidance and modeling. But also we need to find ways to have the federation build upon these and develop financial support for enabling EDID to eliminate Eurocentrism, colonialism, racism, and other oppressions. And then um, to develop those effective policies, regulations, practices um, that will ensure human dignity, safety, and respect for human rights and, and to systemic discrimination. So in the report, oftentimes we've talked about the 42 recommendations. We've talked about the promising practices in the, in the, um, the um, additional part of, um, of the next section. But also within the decolonization section, there are 55 specific elements that are kind of steps uh, that Congress uh, planners host universities can take in order to ensure that they are doing the decolonizing aspect of it. So when we're looking at these multiple practices, there are more than 42 recommendations. We have 55 actual steps in decolonization. And then finally, we also have the elements dealing with um, the uh, promising practices uh, for conference uh, delivery. With that, I just want to say how delighted I am that we've got to this place where um, we can take this out and share this with all the people who have joined this um, this group today. I'm just delighted to be able to hand this over and and begin to get to work at doing the kind of work that needs to be done. So with that, I turn over to Melinda. Thank you. Um... So mindful of time, I'm just gonna simply say, so if you can go to my next slide on, on the uh, presentation. As it gets pulled up. So also, uh, so, so Dr. Batiste was going over this slide, over this content of this section. And what I wanna highlight for people in this section is, we actually highlight the intersections of, uh, also the intersections of decolonization and anti-racism, going back to the early decolonizing in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Uh, we, we, we highlight the ways in which um, uh, that uh, the, the scholars from um, uh, uh, across uh, Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and the indigenous scholars engage in that work. Um, and we also highlight the implications for our disciplines, our syllabi, our scholarship. And we call for the Federation to, to take these, this work up in terms of the UN DRIP and the UN Decade for People of African Descent, but also the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. 
So there's a lot of content in that section, which I think uh, would be really fruitful for scholars in the social science and humanities uh, community to go beyond again, the, the gestures or using of these concepts as metaphors. Next slide, please. In this section, we actually, um, where we drew on the work of a, a, an RA to help us pull together all of the kinds, the complex work that we were trying to do in this, um, in, in this, in this report. We had to think about dealing with anti-Black racism and colonialism, which was the, which helped to ignite the report, as well as what would it mean for the Federation to take equity, diversity, inclusion, decolonization seriously. Okay, that means going beyond um, one or two equity deserving groups as has been done historically to think more complexity about five equity deserving groups, to think more complexly about bilingualism, about multilingualism in terms of uh, indigenous languages, to think about sign languages, to think about deaf culture. We had to think more deeply about what does it mean to talk about gender, gender identity, gender expression, about LGBTQ2+, mindful that within that queer alphabet, that's not one identity, but multiple, mindful that power and privilege op operates within that, including at, at the, that group, at the intersections. So for example, how do how does the L word fare in relation to say the G word, gay, lesbian to gay, or how does how do trans experience themselves at Congress or other federation events, or even in our disciplines, departments, and our universities? Persons with disabilities are often left out, or dif dif disabilities are become what's visible or they become uh, sort of, and so the question is how to think about and, and, uh, and unsettled ableism. And this actually was a really instructive lesson for, for many of us on the committee, which is to say inclusion, the multiple ways in which inclusion is used in the academy, but the way inclusive design, inclusive uh, practices are used within critical disability studies actually is something different in the same way that inclusive use in terms of income. So we're thinking about um, contract workers, thinking about sessionals, we're thinking about adjuncts, we're thinking about graduate students or students, and so all the discussion around fees must fall. So inclusion entails something about space, about design, and that was really fruitful for us to think about each of these concepts. And if we took each of the equity deserving groups seriously, how would those concepts be understood? So in this better practices uh, guide, each of these groups are, are thought about, but everything also religious and cultural minorities. And I must say in, in this work, as I, we were working to finalize the report for release, working with Dr. Anne-José Villeneuve who, who talks about who, around the translation of the English to the French and the sensibilities, how they vary in the French, for example, was really fruitful. And again, I think this is the work of our disciplines, social science and humanities, and we ought to be contributing in a much more robust way. And I think the Federation has a responsibility and an obligation, an opportunity to bring together our scholarly association to think more deeply, to write more deeply but also to affect systemic and structural change. So I hope people will find this guide productive and useful because it talks about better practices in face-to-face, -face, in hybrid and in virtual conferences. And it actually speaks to and takes seriously and does not try to produce a one size fits all for equity deserving groups, but actually attends to a similarities and difference and intersections. And I think the resources and references will be helpful. Next slide, please. The, the, the final aspect of the, the report, one of the final aspects of the report is the charter, which we see as a vehicle or an instrument for the Federation to use to mobilize 
for itself, and it has signed on to it, as a way of having both horizontal, vertical and horizontal accountabilities. How can the Federation continue this work? Not on its own, because it's a, it's a Federation of member associations. So that's in tandem with scholarly associations, Congress hosts, hosts of other Federation events, and also universities. And when I say universities, I mean universities who have put in bids for Congress and universities in terms of disciplines from, uh, from which our scholarly associations members emerge. So um, we, in that uh, charter, the preamble, the principles we articulate, but we also highlight 13 commitments and we encourage, and, and the Federation is encouraging member association and universities and affiliates to endorse that charter. Uh, we couldn't strongly, we couldn't, we, we, we strongly agree with this, but more than just to endorse a charter as a performative gesture to say, see, oh, we signed this charter. It is an accountability mechanism to say, if we took equity deserving groups seriously, individually and intersectionally, here are the things we must commit to in order to make meaning and, and, and achieve results. And not to further engender cynicism about the ways in which universities can do and colleges and associations can do all kinds of things um, that give the impression of listening, of engaging in change. And we don't wanna be 10 years or 20 years down the road and say, there's another report that was filed away, another deep commitment, good intentions, good results, but the change we envision that we desire have not come into effect. Liz Coleman argued that universities are known for their ability, um, their ability to uh, learn helplessness. And when it comes to EDID, I can tell you for three decades of this work, we have seen this learned helplessness. Oh, we don't know how to do this. Oh, we can't do this. Can do institutions all of a sudden become helplessness. This is, well, this is not compelling. The best research universities, the extraordinary disciplines, great intellects, not just in Canada, but in the world, cannot be taken seriously with a, we can't. This is a moment for us to rise to the occasion and to be the change that is necessary for more equitable institutions, disciplines, scholarly associations and federation, but also in doing so, we are contributing to the betterment of the societies in which we live and to the country that we call home. So this is, this is the, the moment for this change is now. And so I hope that the recommendation, the 43 recommendations that we make, those recommendations, which are to the Federation, those recommendations which also invite collaborations with scholarly associations and, and national associations like SHRC and Universities Canada and Canadian Association of University Teachers, those recommendations help us to have, to, to be better, to put on better events, but more than that, to actually think about the systemic and structural changes needed in our disciplines, our scholarly associations, but also in ourselves. We can't change these things without changing ourselves. And that's the accountability and responsibility about our complicity. We're not outside these changes. We are deeply implicated in them. We are part of them. So this is work we must do together. And so we are hoping that we have turned over this um, docu these documents to the Federation and we would we welcome the opportunity to work with members of the social science and humanities community and universities and colleges and associations more broadly to realize these changes. So the charter is an opportunity for accountabilities. It's like dimensions, EDI, the Athena Swan elsewhere, um, the Kiran Charter in India, these global charters. They are not, they're not just performative gestures. My view is if, you know, if those who sign on to these 
we can see take as serious actors who care not just about talking about things, about statements, about doing the concrete things necessary to effect change. So I want to end by thanking the Black Canadian Studies Association, who, because of their principal response to racism and racial profiling, helped ignite the work we have engaged in and that we will continue to engage in beyond this event. So I want to thank members of the Indigenous Advisory Circle, the former members who contact us and inform our work, who will continue to ignite change around reconciliation, indigenization, as well as uh, decolonial reconciliation in terms of land-based education and so on. And I want to thank members of scholarly associations that are already doing the work that supported the Black Canadian Studies in solidarity and in, in the process further emphasize that the need for change. Now let's roll up our sleeves and get some work done and we must do that together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Smith, Dr. Golfman, Dr. Batiste, uh, for this detailed overview of uh, your work and this important report. I'd like to uh, open up the question uh, question period right now. Uh, so I we will prioritize uh, the questions for, for the committee. Um, and if there's time, we'll also take questions for the Federation, uh, but we'll post all questions and all answers on our website next week. So uh, uh, if we don't get to questions, we, we will post them on the website. So we have a question uh, and the first question is, um, as Dr. Smith stated, people need to acknowledge the harms they've caused then what have those whose racist beliefs and actions at UBC Congress led to that led to this committee and report done to date in this respect? So, I mean, I... <laughs> I can partly speak to that, but I think this is, I, I, I think we should take this comment and advisement. Uh, mindful, I think that there would be members of the UBC community who would be here. One of our recommendations, as you saw in, in, in my presentation, I tried to provide this genealogy because I actually think that genealogy is important in terms of accountability. One of our recommendations highlight the shift from UBC to Western, the theme, and now to the U of A. And we didn't want to get lost in that shift the need for all institutions to attend to anti-Black racism, anti-Asian -ra racism, anti-Indigenous racism, and connect the dot. That, these th that, that the, the harm may have happened on one territory or one in one place, but that the, the, the accountabilities continue to others. So I know um, Shelby McPhee spoke at UBC after this event. We are encouraging the Federation to work with UBC Western and the U of A to actually continue this conversation around anti-Black racism and anti-Indigenous racism. But then also that's one separate recommendation. A second recommendation is, and, and that the Federation has agreed to, is to uh, post-COVID, the first opportunity there is for the Federation to take up this theme of anti-Black racism, colonialism, and, and decolonization, that it must do so. And I know the Federation has committed to that. But those are just big simple things. There are other kinds of things at the micro level in terms of fees, in terms of how do you create spaces which are not a welcoming in practice for uh, people to come into Congress, whether they're being included into, that, that's deeper. That requires scholarly associations to hold their members accountable. It requires universities to make sure that the graduate students and postdocs and professors who are coming to Congress 
also have anti-racist um, uh, 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 commitments. And so the, the, it, you, we cannot separate that, th that other level um, from just the Congress. It's also about the people who come to Congress from universities and the scholarly associations that are members of, of the, the Federation. So thanks for that question. And I hope, I hope uh, the Federation takes that up again with our colleagues at UBC. Thank you very much, Melinda. And we have a second question. It is in French. So I will have Camille read it and uh, it will be translated as well in, uh, if you're using the translation service. And Dr. Anjo jo Jose will turn our camera on too. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. The question is, bonjour, pouvez-vous nous dire en plus, uh, 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 nous en dire plus sur le choix des mots équité, diversité et inclusion pour avoir choisi ces mots-là et quelle en est l'origine Par exemple, les premières utilisations dans le contexte de la lutte pour les changements sociaux. Je vous remercie d'avance pour votre réponse. I'm going to repeat this question in English. Uh, could you tell us more about the choice of words equity, diversity and inclusion? Why choose these words and when were they first used in the context of fighting for social change? Thank you in advance for your response. Merci Camille. So I will let uh, Angela, Ange, do you want me to go first or do you want to go first? I'll just I'll just say thank you for the for the question. Um, J'ai donné une, une réponse partielle uh, dans le dans le chat avec les définitions qu'on a utilisées dans uh, le rapport. Donc vous pouvez facilement accéder aux, uh, aux diverses définitions, non seulement de équité, diversité et inclusion, mais également de décolonisation. Alors uh, je I, I will I would pass it over to Melinda to give a more uh, uh, broader uh, answer in English. Thank you. So as, as I uh, briefly alluded to in the presentation, the language of equity, you can trace back to the 1984 report of the Royal Commission on Equality in Employment, which was, the chair of that was uh, Judge Rosalie Silverman Abella. That equity language then got taken up in the uh, Employment Equity Act. It's also for universities involved in the federal contractors program. So there, there, there are over, there's over three decades of work with around equity. And initially it was employment equity focus, which is about hiring of, uh, of staff and faculty to reflect, and administrators, just to be clear, um, to reflect the diversity of the Canadian population. There was understanding that they faced barriers and biases and that you, uh, employment equity was necessary to try to remove those equity. It's actually, we are now talking about diversity and inclusion, and that the diversity turn in some ways could, uh, was seen as a, a, a move, a corporate move, because people were talking about equity fatigue, even though they hadn't achieved any results. And the diversity language now, I, I would argue, and our, our report highlights, um, is used, diversity is used multiple ways. So while it was meant that equity would lead to the diversity of peoples, Diversity typically, so it would lead to more women, it would lead to more persons with disabilities, it would lead to more people who are LGBTQ+, it would lead to persons, uh, more racialized people. Um, what, what, what's happened with the language of diversity, it's now used to talk about diversity of perspectives, to shift the focus from people. Um, it's used to talk about diversity of disciplines, diversity of institutions. So if you see CGEP, are you a university, are you a college? Diversity in the higher education sector generally. So it doesn't quite do the work of equity, which is ameliorating barriers and biases and outcomes for members of the designated, uh, of the des deserve, equity deserving groups. And in the inclusive turn, again, um, is also really in, important. I mean, people use, again, inclusive because they think that in some ways diversity focuses too much on numerical or empirical representation and, 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 the, and inclusion is more about the qualitative experience, but not, but not just if you are invited in, but how you experience the, the sort of climate, culture, space of institutions. So the inclusive turn then has led to whole discussions around inclusive excellence, inclusive curriculum, inclusive cultures, uh, inclusive leadership, uh, and inclusion as a skill and a mindset. 
So they, these words don't do the same kind of things, but the acronym in some ways obscures it. The D that we have added to the EDI is actually trying to do something even different. It is reminding of us of territory, of place, and how that is formed by the, the history of colonialism, which has impacted our institutions and have impacted our disciplines. So our disciplines are mostly inherited from Europe and our, in, in the social science and humanities, our canons and our curriculum are based on scholars and scholarship from six countries. I think the research suggests six countries. And I also say even to my feminist colleagues and to my uh, people who do post-colonial studies, post-colonial scholarship is post, maybe intellectually, but often it is rooted in scholarship in Europe. It has not decolonized. It doesn't include necessarily indigenous scholars and, and, and scholarship or ways of thinking and being. And it often doesn't include scholarship from Africa or Latin America or Asia. So it's not even, a, it's not a decolonial scholarship, which is where I would suggest sort of the work of um, Pujano or Gross Vogel or others who talk about decoloniality, um, which is actually my attempts to the scholarship we draw on as well as the curriculums and the implications for that, the citational practices. So our work brings together all of this complexity to shape how we go from questions of representation to a deeper engagement about how EDID would change the way our, our Congress works, our scholarly associations work, but then also our disciplines and universities. So that genealogy has been over the, the, the connection between them over the past 30 years or so. Thank you so much, Melinda. Um, so we, we have uh, another question, but before I pose that question, I think I'll make this the last question for now. We have recorded all the questions that um, have appeared in the, the question and answer um, uh, in the chat. And we will provide answers to those in writing uh, and we'll post them on the, the Federation website. And uh, so I, I'll ask one more question and then I will provide some feedback on what the, the Federation is doing as part of their commitment. So let's take this last question. I'll speak for a few minutes. I'm sorry that we're gonna be going a little bit past time, but I promise uh, when I uh, provide the overview, I'll, I'll do it as quickly as possible, but also share everything that we discuss and uh, everything that's in the chat, answer the questions. We will post those on, um, on the website so I just am mindful of time and uh, so the last question is many associations and individuals have chosen to boycott Congress this year my association and myself included stemming from the BCSA's concerns these recommendations look very useful but I'm not convinced the Federation will adopt them besides continuing boycotting what can associations and individuals, especially those without an EDI claim and thus a level of privilege, uh, do to hold the Federation accountable? I want to thank you for that question. It's actually really important and it highlights a lesson we learned when we were doing our consultation, but also one that I was aware of when I was Vice President of Equity at the Federation. The Federation includes every single scholarly association who that attends it. So it remained the headquarters of the, so that, so, so the Federation is accountable to member associations. So the conversation around boycott, boycotts is a conversation among members of the same association. This is really important. So I would say to scholarly associations, if you want your representative body to take EDID seriously, that requires holding them accountable by engaging with them. That's one thing. The second thing is I, our report emerges in the context of these conversations around people feeling like they're not, they not being listened to and heard. That is as true for scholarly associations in relation to Federation and Congress as it is to equity, diversity, inclusion, decolonization, reconciliation, indigenization committees, in our universities. We, there's a, there's a general feeling that leadership in these bodies 
are not listening to members and are not listening to the grassroots, to the students, faculty, so, uh, uh, and scholars, uh, 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 and staff. This is a moment of accountability. And my view is your voices have been heard to the extent that the committee was created. We have, con we have worked on our, uh, our recommendations. The Federation has produced a plan of action. Whether the Federation follows through with that will depend on member associations insisting on it. The charter, we believe, is a mechanism by which scholarly associations can continue to be in conversation with the Federation to ensure in this moment and going forward, it attends to anti-Black racism but, and racism in all its form, as well as all forms of discrimination, because our report is attentive to gender identity and gender expression. It is also attentive to disabilities um, and ableism. And it is attentive to not just um, uh, racism, but what does it mean to, to, for people to thrive, for people to be reflected in curriculum, to be people to be reflected in, 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 in activities. So it, it, it invites us to go, diff, to be, go deeper. And the final comment I'll make, none of us are outside these developments. I mean, I, I draw on Albert Memi here, but the colonizer who accept and the colonizer who refuses. Even those who refuse are implicated in this. That's why we use the language of journey and lifelong learning. Because we, even when we think we are great at gender, we may not be great at anti-racism. And then so, that, so we could make symbolic gestures towards anti-racism. I have yet to see this deep understanding. So that's just me. So I would say that we all have work to do. And I would say that especially around disabilities, visible and invisible, much work to be done. So when we engage the Federation around anti-Black racism, let's not forget that we are also in this committee and in the charter and in the inclusive conference guide, pushing all of us to engage much more deeply with each of the equity deserving groups and these issues in tandem. And when we do that, we will see that none of us can opt out of this struggle. It is all of our work and the social science and humanities communities individually and together must step up. And even that step up language is an ableist language, are called upon to do this work. So yes, I think you're being heard. Yes, continue to speak through the power and yes, engage deeply in holding yourself as individuals, your scholarly associations and the Federation accountable for getting this work done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melinda. I, incredibly powerful words. Um, so at this point, I'd, I'd like to um, turn it over to what we're going to be doing as a federation, our commitments. Um, and we know that there's a lot of work that has to be attended to, but we also know that it's going to take a lot of collaboration with members of our community, with associations, with institutions. Uh, the recommendations in this report, but especially the charter, they offer a pathway forward for all of us, all of us who are committed to equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization. So yesterday at the Federation, we announced a new five-point action plan uh, to support the committee's recommendations. So uh, we have a, a summary of that, uh, a summary slide of uh, the, um, the, the, the five-point action plan. So first, we have endorsed the report and we're taking action on all 43 of its recommendations. Second, we're following through on our commitments to the Black Canadian Studies Association and planning a future face-to-face -face Congress centered on Black and Indigenous experience and scholarship in Canada. Third, we're putting in place the people, structures, and resources that are required to make and sustain progress. This includes a new three-year $500,000 funding commitment. It includes hiring a new uh, senior position responsible for EDID, creating a standing committee with broad representation from our membership 
to lead implementation of the report and establishing a transparent reporting uh, framework so we're accountable to all our members. Fourth, we're listening to our members and supporting their ideas, which includes a commitment to dedicate expo space to black, black uh, authors and black owned bookstores and working with uh, the black Canadian, uh, black Canadian scholars to develop Congress programming. Fifth and finally, uh, we're adopting the Charter on Equity, Diversity, Inclusion and Decolonization. And we're encouraging scholarly associations, institutions, and everyone in the social science and humanities communities to discuss, to read, to support, and to, uh, and to promote the Charter. We also have a list of immediate next steps that we're going to be taking, which starts with the publishing, as I mentioned, of all the answers to all the questions that were posed today, even if we didn't uh, um, talk to them directly uh, in this presentation. There will be more news and more opportunities to be involved in the coming weeks. I especially want to thank all the members of the committee uh, for all their work uh, in putting together this report and to Dr. Batiste, Dr. Golfman, and Dr. Smith uh, for their presentation this afternoon. It's, it was incredibly inspiring and, and I'm, I'm forever grateful. It's, uh, it's truly a call to action for all of us. So I want to thank you all for joining us today, for engaging with us on these critical issues. If you have questions, please feel free to send them to the Federation to us at federation at ideas .ca. I look forward to doing more work together and uh, deep, uh, meaningful, transformative work together. And I wish you a good rest of your day.